Talk Audio is proudly sponsored by Hogstrike USA. Hogstrike is an industry leader in surgical microscopes. A brilliant fusing of Swiss optics, German engineering, and years of experience allow them to produce surgical microscopes, slit lamps, and ophthalmic diagnostics that exceed ophthalmic surgery needs and set future standards for optics, engineering, ergonomics, and imaging. Learn how you can work more efficiently and effectively with Hogstrike at hsmicroscopes.com. Hello and welcome to iTalk Audio, a podcast dedicated to the eye care industry and the trials and tribulations thereof. My name is Daryl. I will be your host today. And we have a fantastic guest that we're super excited about. So without any further ado, I'm going to say hello to our wonderful guest, Dr. Sean McCafferty. Hello, sir. Uh, Hello, Daryl. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. So uh, real quick, if you would, give us a little bit of a eh, 90-second intro of who you are, um, kind of your background, some of the achievements that you've accomplished before what we're going to talk about today for those who may not be familiar with you and your work. Okay. Uh, Well, my name is Sean McCaffrey, of course. I am uh, CEO of Cat Stenometer. That's what we'll be talking about today. But in addition to that, I'm also a practicing ophthalmologist in Tucson, Arizona, at Arizona Eye Consultants, and in addition to that, I also have a long history as being an optical and mechanical engineer, too, with uh, working in several different industries. But that, therein lies the short of it, and that uh, really leads into what we'll be talking about today. It will, and this is something that I'm actually kind of super excited about. Um, Our podcast is relatively new, but what we've focused on so far are kind of the the research that people have been doing, uh, mission work that they've been doing outside of the practice, and kind of the trials and tribulations that that a functioning practice actually has to go through. So I'm really excited today to talk to you about some of the the advances you've been making, because these are more on the mechanical side of things, the tools that people use. So I'm super excited about this. So we should probably announce that recently at ASCRS, you won the second place for the winning pitch award, which is a relatively new thing that ASCRS is doing. And that in and of itself must have been kind of cool because you won. That's kind of neat. Yes, we were very proud of that. And, uh, you know, there's been a a lot of work put in this over the last uh, three and a half years. But uh, part of the fruition of that is... is, uh, uh, having an award um, such as what was received at ASCRS amongst 94 uh, companies that applied for that, we were uh, one of the top three finalists. Uh, yeah, it was some and, pretty and, stiff competition. Yeah, there certainly was. Uh, and uh, we had some help, too, as well along the way. Uh, we had uh, Jane Rady from, uh, uh, had given us a lot of assistance, too, in uh, in our pitch deck. So... Um, let, let's actually start diving right in and talking about what it was that you won for and the, the product that you guys are now offering. Um, so as we're both pretty aware, the eye care industry is constantly trying to improve itself, both in its research and the devices it uses, um, the, the actual procedures that people use. And um, that, that's just trying to improve the overall care of what everybody what everybody did. You developed a device, and we're going to dive into this in, in detail, but you developed a device that's assisting with the diagnosis of, well, assists assist with the diagnosis of certain aspects, a tool that is used every single day by pretty much every ophthalmologist. What was it first that you saw that said, hey, there's a need here for improvement for this thing? Uh, well, the, first of all, you have to look at uh, the primary uh, disease process, looking at this, and it's glaucoma. But, of course, we do look at pressure every single day. It, it's arguably the, the second leading, uh, the second most important metric that we look at to vision every day as an eye care professional. Uh, but glaucoma is uh, something that affects about 80 million people worldwide, and yet about 50% of those people remain undiagnosed. Uh, the Goldman Affirmation Tonometer, which is, uh, has been the standard of care and remains a standard of care for really the last 60 years, um, has been used for by practitioners worldwide and been completely unreplaced. It is the exact same technology as it, as it existed uh, back in uh, the 1950s, uh, really completely unchanged. And now we have an entire glaucoma market, which is uh, burgeoning in the U.S., $8.1 billion a year with new pharmaceutical implants, MIG devices. Sure. Uh, but still, go ahead. No, no, I was just agreeing with you. Okay. Uh, and uh, still, the only leading indicator uh, of glaucoma is intraocular pressure, and the only metric of treatment is lowering intraocular pressure, and still the standard of care for measuring that pressure for 60 years is the Goldman Affirmation Uh And 
we recognize that uh, that there are significant errors. Even Goldman recognized that back in 1957. There were significant errors in Goldman ablation sonometry because everybody's variable. We have different corneal thicknesses. We have different corneal rigidities, corneal hysteresis, et cetera. Uh, which induce errors in that. And it's so much so that uh, 50% of the population, one, 50 out of every 100 people will have an error significant enough that it potentially could lead to blindness. Uh, that being defined as anything over the grade, greater than plus or minus two millimeters of mercury. And several people, of course, are over-treated because of that too as well. Uh, and that's really where it lies the, the genesis of CAT's denominator. So you kind of touched on this, and as I was doing a little bit of more background research uh, prior to our talk, um, I was surprised by the amounts of inaccuracies that can occur in this area. And that's obviously something that can complicate care down the road if, you, if there's a misdiagnosis or even just a simple misunderstanding of exactly what was going on. If you're not reading things correctly, if you're not getting the proper information, that affects care. And so the device that you've developed... Um, if I read this right, has a 94% increase, which is huge. Right. If you look at somebody over a standard population and they have varying corneal thicknesses and uh, varying corneal rigidities, they've had LASIK, et cetera, uh, that uh, 50% of the population can have an error of plus or minus 2 millimeters of mercury. The CATS tonometer solution in this new uh, device that we developed uh, improves that 50% of the population, uh, that, that down to 3% of the population, which will have an error greater than plus or minus 2 millimeters of mercury, and that's what leads to a 94% improved accuracy uh, in IOP measurement. You know, I, I liken it to, uh, say if you went to the doctor and uh, you come in and your temperature is uh, 103, uh, we know automatically that you're either sick, you have some inflammatory disease, or something else. Uh, but if you came in with, uh, if you came in with 103 and the, the temperature was 96 plus or minus five, we have no idea. We have to look at if you're actually getting sick. We have to do OCTs. We have to look at your nerve fiber layer. We have to do visual fields uh, to be able to determine whether or not you're actually sick because that that temperature reading no longer has significance because it has such a great range. Well, that's exactly the same thing with intraocular pressure. And what we're trying to do is narrow that range down to something that's more meaningful uh, so that you have a much more accurate measurement and you're able to reset IOP as being one of the leading indicators of both the diagnosis and the adequate treatment of glaucoma. So, uh, again, in doing my research, um, you have a mechanical engineering background. So something like this just must have come kind of naturally to you, looking at the, the physical devices that you're using to accomplish the goals of what you're trying to do in diagnosis and, and treatments. So how hands-on were you with your background in the actual physical development of this particular, this particular product? Was it more conceptual? Did you actually have hands-on in the design work? Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, it really wasn't easy. I wouldn't call it that. I, <laughs> I think if we, if we look back, I mean, I started working with Dr. Cynthia Roberts out of Ohio State University doing corneal biomechanics back in the early 90s. And I was doing finite element analysis to show how the cornea deformed and things like that. So this was a natural progression to what we were looking at. I, uh, at some later, about maybe five years ago, one of my glaucoma partners came to me and said, you know what, I, I really wish we could have something a little more accurate than this. Is there anything you could do? And I want a few other things, too, in it, too, as well. I said, you know what, that actually probably is something that I could do. So I started looking at it, and I... Uh, came up with the idea of uh, modifying the surface of the Goldman Applination Sonometer that would uh, minimize all of the errors due to corneal biomechanics uh, to such a degree that would make it far more accurate than what it is. Uh, and uh, I initially started with a prototype, uh, which was just a simple concave surface uh, on there, and I was able to show that it decreased the errors significantly when you looked at central corneal thickness. In other words, it's just about completely corrected for central corneal thickness wow. uh, variations uh, in uh, amongst all the patients that I was looking at. Um, so from there, 
we took it, we redeveloped our finite element analysis, a computer program basically that takes a mechanical process, you know, such as the cornea, and it says what will happen when you deform it or push on it or anything else like that. And we optimize that surface to minimize the errors of central corneal thickness, corneal rigidity, corneal curvature, and even corneal tear film simultaneously. We did what we call a parametric solution, where it takes all four of those variables and it minimizes them simultaneously on an iterative process, which takes literally uh, weeks to do <laughs> right. uh, on, on CPU time. But uh, that's how we really came up with it. So, yes, I mean, I was very much conceptual. There was a lot of things that I knew uh, in my background, and I was very much hands-on. Uh, in the development process, but I do have an entire team of people too that uh, that are that are very highly trained in doing finite element analysis, uh, uh, the engineering work, and everything else too as well. So it wasn't just me by any means. Absolutely, and I'm not trying to minimize the people that you work with that were able to do the, the some of the more hands-on. I was just trying to figure out with your background how involved you were through from the start to finish. Um, real quick question from from concept to market: about how long was that? Um, we're going to be in the market here within the next couple of minutes with our uh, dispo- with our reusable design. Our disposable design will follow within the next uh, six to nine months after that. Uh, but we uh, uh, we're probably looking at about three and a half years uh, from concept uh, to uh, actual implementation. Uh, and there was a lot in that period of time too, as well. And, uh, um, but that, that's about the time frame. And to me, that seems like a relatively quick turnaround. Am I am I accurate in that? And in, when you talk about most uh, device processes going through, yes, it is. That, that, that's very quick. But we were very focused yeah, on yeah. Uh, getting this through um, and getting it out there. Yeah, it, it sounds to me from, again, um, do, doing the research that you knew exactly what you were trying to accomplish, and once you had that initial breakthrough, the rest of it was just implementing what the, what the the idea was, basically. Uh, yes, that is true. I mean, essentially, it was uh, obtaining uh, the design process that we needed to uh, to optimize it, then going through our uh, FDA clinical trial, uh, which is 173 randomized patient clinical trial. Uh, and uh, also the the process of getting the word out there too as yes. well. We have seven peer-reviewed journal articles, the latest of which is in the uh, American Journal of Ophthalmology and British Journal of Ophthalmology, which show this uh, uh, this mechanical advantage that we have on o- over the uh, uh, golden affirmation phenomenon. Absolutely, I- I'm a marketing guy, so I understand that the I, the the concept of trying to get. Uh, the word out on whether it's a procedure or a product or just a re- simply good idea. It's never as simple and as easy as you think it is. No, that is absolutely true. So um, with this with this new device, and everybody seems pretty, pretty excited about it. There was gen- definitely some buzz about it at ASCRS. I knew about that. Um, the word does seem to be spreading about it. Have you um, had other other docs try it in the practice, either on a trial basis or that you've been working with through beta testing and gotten feedback from them at this point about uh, how, how they're working with it? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, we trialed it uh, within our practice right. uh, amongst several of the glaucoma docs that we had there, uh, and they found it very easy to use. It's implementation, actually. You just Any Goldman affination phenomena that you have in your clinic, you take off the the uh, the the uh, golden prism that you have on there, you replace it with the cat's prism, uh, and everything with your throughput, your your evaluation, everything else is exactly the same. Uh, we found that uh, in our beta testing with uh, more than a dozen docs, initially that uh, they were able to use it instantly, uh, without even any um, uh, without any instruction or anything else too. As well, they simply put it on there and they were able to use it. Uh, I think that most of them uh, have said, uh, actually all of them have said, when they come across a patient where they have uh, a question about whether or not their intraocular pressure might be significantly different than what they've been measuring in the past, such as people with LASIK, uh, that almost universally that they will find that there's a significant pressure difference between what they're measuring with the CATS and the GAT. And that really is what brings it home. That says, you know what, this thing is telling me something that I, I strongly thought was the case, and this is telling me, yes, that is the case. The pressures are much higher or lower in some cases, too, right. as well, uh, than what I anticipated. And with such significant improvements, um, 
I know from history, people tend to be rather skeptical. If you did like a, a, a good improvement, people tend to buy that a little easier than if you have such a leap as you have had with, with this device. Um, did you find a lot of initial resistance? Like you guys must be doing something wrong. There's, there's no way you could have gotten that significant of an increase. Well, I, I think that we're, we had a little bit of an advantage because we already have algorithms out there that correct for central corneal thickness. And it's debatable sure. you know, to a degree which that's helpful and things like that, too, as well. Uh, but if you use your, uh, your, your central corneal thickness correction algorithms, uh, more often than not, what the pressures that you'll be getting with the castanometers compared to the gap will follow that. Uh, so that okay. really that really brings it home, and it says, you know what, this this really is doing something that I thought was going on anyway. Uh, but in addition to that, not just the central corneal thickness, but also the people that had LASIK and other things too as well. It shows a significant difference. So it really is it's it is uh, reinforcing what you thought initially anyway. Okay. Uh, and with a few surprises every now and then too, or as well, where you think, you know, I I didn't have this person as a glaucoma suspect, but now they are because. This obviously is measuring a much higher pressure. In addition to that, we also took this out to some of the thought leaders uh, within the industry, too, as well. Uh, we took this out to John Berdahl at, uh, uh, at Vance Thompson Vision yep. uh, and had him trial it, along with his whole team out there, too, as well. Uh, they have, uh, I think, probably about 10 different doctors out there. Uh, and we even had the technicians use it, too, as well, just to see the ease of use and whether or not they saw things that, that they felt was different. And at least two other docs out there have changed uh, their uh, their thought process and uh, uh, and their practice while we were there on, on various patients. In addition, uh, the uh, the practice has ordered our CAT sonometers uh, prisms to replace to replace everyone uh, to every every one of the uh, things out there. Uh, so uh, let me take one quick breath on that. Sure. Um, yeah, in Vance Thompson Vision, uh, their practice manager had called us to replace all of their Goldman prisms with CAT sonometer prisms in their practice, which is a very large practice. Uh, in addition to that, we also went out with uh, uh, Nathan Radcliffe, too, uh, as, as well, out at, in New York, uh, who's another thought leader in glaucoma. Uh, and he also trialed this and, again, showed some of the very same uh, processes where it was correcting for central corneal thickness, and it was following along with corneal hysteresis, too, as well, as far as being a correction, uh, uh, and uh, following along with the independent risk that you see with uh, either low or uh, with low corneal hysteresis. And that kind of does a very nice segue into one of my well, my final question for you, which is um, you mentioned that the folks at Vance Thompson, great, great group of people out there. I, I love the folks at Vance Thompson, um, that they've started to change the nature of how they they approach this. Um, it was, was Is that more of a byproduct, or how do you see the, the cats actually kind of changing the nature of how the care is currently being performed moving forward? Obviously, there will, it will be, I think, more accurate. Obviously, we can see that. But do you, do you envision any other changes as you, the docs are starting to use it, you're getting feedback, or did you just envision changes yourself? Um, well, the changes I envision is, first of all, I mean, it's, it's a natural transition. You're, when you get a new product or you get a new uh, 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 slit lamp, you obviously get a um, tonometer with it. And the tonometer that, uh, that, that we've developed essentially can go right along with that, and seamlessly, too, as well. So in other words, uh, it simply is a change out from one prism to the other, so it, right. the transition is very easy. Uh, but in addition to that, um, I think that once it grabs hold, once people see that this is a significant advantage to them, that eventually it becomes a critical point at which it becomes a standard of care. And if you're not using it, then you really are falling below the standard of care uh, in, in measuring intraocular pressure. Th those are always good kind of watershed moments when you, when you can look back and say, you know what, I raised the standard of care so that what was there once is now the level that I brought it to. And those are always good kind of moments. And that's certainly where we feel we will be. Uh, you know, it's a matter of time. We don't know exactly when that will happen, but sure. we feel very confident that the ease of implementation and the significantly improved methods that are able to save sight uh, would be uh, able to capture that, that standard of care position. 
Sweet. Um, well, Dr. McCafferty, I absolutely appreciate your time today. Thank you ever so kindly. If you have any final thoughts or words you'd like to throw out there, more than happy to. Uh, we uh, we look forward to uh, to uh, talking with people um, and to trialing this too as well. We will be um, have this out in the market within the next few months. And uh, any information that you uh, want to gain further on this, you can gain it from uh, cats i o p c a t s i o p dot com. And we'll make sure to mention that in either the pre or post to this podcast so people can actually go and find it and learn a little bit more. Uh, Once again, Dr. McCavity, thank you ever so kindly. Uh, This is absolutely amazing. I'm really glad that you had the the time to chat with me today. We wish you all the best, of course, and we'll probably be doing some follow-ups down the road. Uh, Thank you, Daryl. We uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. Have a great day, and thank you all for listening. iTalk Audio is sponsored by Curious Conversations Marketing. Curious Conversations Marketing believes in the power of story. They help businesses just like yours tell their story in their way with their words. Curious Conversations uses the digital world to tell the story of your business. From the people to the product, let Curious Conversations assist you in telling the story of your business. Focused in the digital realm, from social media, reviews, and reputation management, an overall online presence, to creating, recording, and hosting podcasts just like this one. Learn more at CuriousConversationsMarketing.com.